Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of True Crime with the Sarge. I'm your host, Joseph Jackalone. Tonight, we have a very special guest. We have David Fisher. Now, David is the director of the Forensic Science Program at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is located in Newark, New Jersey. And prior to that, he was a criminalist for the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner. We're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk about his forensic education and his accreditation. He's also co-authored two books, Crime Scene Investigation, now in its ninth edition, and also he uh, Forensics Demystified. So welcome to the show. We're going to bring him on stage now. David, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Sure, no problem. I mean, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, any, this is about everything about forensics that people were afraid to ask. I asked everybody if they had questions throughout the show uh, to post them in the in the chat. And if we have a couple of minutes, uh, we can answer those questions tonight too. So I wanna talk about forensic education that's going on right now, specifically what you're doing at NJIT. Uh, you just got an accredited uh, program there, correct? That's correct. Um, we were just awarded uh, national accreditation by the Forensic Education Program Accreditation Commission, otherwise known as FEPAC, and they're the national program through the American Academy of Forensic Sciences that accredits both undergraduate and graduate forensic science programs. So we're really excited uh, to have that uh, recognition. Yeah, that's great. I was reading about it and it says you're one of the few programs in the country that actually have attained that accreditation. How difficult was it to get, get it? I mean, what, what, what's involved in the getting accreditation? It was a very involved process. Uh, we started uh, over a year ago, uh, first with the application. We had to submit a self-study, which was a real in-depth dive into you know, all of our courses, our faculty, um, you know, student experiences, um, feedback surveys from students. Um, once we submitted the self-study, there was an on-site review where some feedback assessors came to campus to uh, pretty much look at everything. It's quite similar to a, a crime lab uh, accreditation, uh, only for an academic program. And then there were a few back and forth. Uh, they had comments. We responded to the comments. And uh, we just found out this past February uh, that we were awarded uh, feedback accreditation for our undergraduate program. Well, congratulations. That's great work. And, and it's it's fantastic for your students, right? So as the students get out of this program, they graduate. This is a nice thing to have on their resume. Absolutely. And, you know, I think accreditation makes our graduating students more competitive in the workplace. And, you know, all things being equal, I think lab directors look for students from accredited programs. Um, not to say that you know, students are not good from other programs, but uh, it kind of gives them a leg up when applying for their first job to say that they've come from an accredited program. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So accreditation means a lot specifically. So it's a nice little draw for your program also. So that's something you can offer your students saying, hey, we're we're one of the few accredited forensic science programs out there for the audience, because we I, there's some confusion. But can you just give us a simple definition of what forensic science really is? Because we hear so many different things, and we know there's lots of different disciplines, and we'll talk about that. But what would, what would be the uh, elevator speech for the definition of forensic science? Yeah, so I'm actually asked this question all the time by prospective students, as well as their parents. Uh, so forensics is the application of the natural sciences to legal matters. So it encompasses both criminal cases as well as civil cases, and it's using STEM you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as other natural sciences to um, help legal matters. So we have we have Kay, the forensic theorist. She's going definitions, she's writing them down because she knows there's going to be quiz questions probably going to come directly from this show. So yeah, we, we have, uh, we're building a community here. We have we do forensic science quizzes and criminal investigation quizzes in the community section. And, and that, that's uh, a question on my quizzes as well. So. <laughs> well, there you go. And hopefully you can give us a few more before we uh, end up tonight. This way they can, for the people who are actually watching it, could have a head start for on those that didn't see it yet. So there's lots of different disciplines in forensic science too, right? I mean, what are some of the main ones? I think, I mean, I hear different numbers too. I hear anywhere from 11 to 20 to, you know, all kinds of different things. What do you like, kind of focus in on? Because you can't really do everything. 
Yeah, correct. Uh, it's it's almost impossible to be uh, an expert in everything. So in our program, we have three different concentrations. And I, I kind of like to divide up the forensic science disciplines uh, in these concentration concentrations. So we have forensic biology, forensic chemistry, and our newest concentration is digital forensics. So, you know, within forensic biology, you have obviously forensic DNA, uh, serology, uh, blood spatter, uh, blood stain pattern interpretation. Um, some people would put, you know, forensic medicine, forensic pathology in there, uh, forensic anthropology, perhaps forensic entomology, which deals with insects. Uh, so those are a handful of the forensic biology disciplines. And then within forensic chemistry, you have um, drug analysis, toxicology. Um, yeah, the list can go on and on, right? Few others that <laughs> escape me at the moment. And you know, digital forensics, I, I would say, is probably the most um, popular now. Uh, there's so many positions and jobs in digital forensics dealing from mobile device forensics, uh, cloud forensics, uh, of course, computer forensics, and all the electronic devices that we increasingly use in this digital age. So tablets and cell phones and uh, all of those types of things leave behind digital breadcrumbs. Yeah, it's one of, I call them the three forensic horsemen, right? So cell phone records, internet records, and of course, video surveillance. That's all part of all that stuff. Uh, it's actually an interesting uh, side note because it's becoming a huge boon, I guess you would say, for, for policing and, and for investigations because the, what, what people do on the internet and their cell phones, boy, some of these huge cases are being solved because of that. So that's actually an exciting little avenue there. Absolutely. And what's nice about NJT, you know, we have a, a college of computer science. So our program, Forensic Science, is in the College of Science and Liberal Arts. But our program is really a, a joint program uh, with this other college. So students are taking IT courses, computer science courses, as well as the traditional forensic courses. So it's a really great skill set that they're coming out with. And they can, you know, go into cybersecurity or digital forensics. Uh, there's a lot of job openings for those students currently. Is is the digital forensics, um, is that like one of the faster growing avenues you think of the programs that you're seeing, or is it pretty much steady throughout all of them? So I, I think a lot of students uh, major in IT and cybersecurity, and perhaps they're not yet familiar with digital forensics, or if that's even an option for them. So right now it's um, our newest program, and it's not as well subscribed as the traditional forensic disciplines. But I think over time, uh, more and more students will, you know, realize the tremendous benefits of having this type of background, and will help them uh, either land a, a, a private sector position, maybe at a, a firm doing cybersecurity, uh, or in a government digital lab doing uh, computer forensic work. So Crafty has, so what, are, I guess, what are the digital forensics that we're actually talking about? What are some of the avenues of uh, exploration that they're looking for? So, you know, obviously we have video forensics, um, mobile device forensics, and really, you know, any type of crime has some form of digital component, whether it's locating a suspect using GPS coordinates or getting a, a geofence, you know, we can talk about what that is um, sure. through Google. Um, I mean, I'm per personally, I'm not a, a digital expert, but uh, some of the faculty in our program have uh, a lot of experience. Uh, we have one faculty member who's a, a detective uh, for one of the counties in New Jersey, and he does, you know, digital forensics ranging from uh, cleaning up poor quality videos that are pixelated to try to come up with a license plate uh, or a, a picture of a suspect at an ATM machine, for example, or maybe proceeds were distributed illegally. So looking at those tr transactions over, you know, one of the digital currency platforms like Venmo or PayPal or something like that. And of course, your traditional emails and looking at IP addresses to find out where things were sent from and who they were sent to. 
those types of um, components uh, encompass digital forensics. Yeah, I and mean, when you think about it, it opens up so many avenues for employment. So you have you know the financial investigations angle of this. So somebody who takes a digital program, a forensic program, I mean, really the sky's the limit. And I, I mean, that's if if I had a young kid and he and he or she wanted to do this, I would tell this is the avenue to go into because the digital stuff isn't going anywhere. It's only going to get more complicated, especially with encryption and all the other th different things going on. So there's going to be a need for those experts in the yeah, future. Yeah, sure. artificial intelligence now is oh, a yeah. big buzzword. So AI and forensics. Um, I'm, I'm a member of New Jersey Association of Forensic Scientists, and we're actually hosting a seminar, uh, at, you know, forensic science in the age of AI. So that is really, I think, where the future is headed, how we can use machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, in our day-to-day -day casework. And, you know, what, how are we going to deal with images that were created by AI, um, documents, all these things have some sort of legal implication. So we, we kind of have to see where all this is headed. Yeah, no, I remember as, uh, you know, when doing investigations and, and uh, supervising them, you get the the VHS tape from the bodega that was used like a hundred times and you get these blurry images and now you get these crystal clear images from Mars, but the ATM machine is still screwing up, right? You still can't, I still, I don't get that in a million years, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of miles away. You get perfect pictures, the ATM machine, not so much. Yep. Yep. Makes me that nuts. Is. I always tell if I had hair, I'd pull it out sometimes when you're dealing with this stuff and um, just, but it, there's a need for this. And, and it's, I'm glad that the students are actually getting exposure to that. So you guys have actually a CSI lab at the school. So how, talk about a practical uh, experience for the, for the kids. I'm assuming they really enjoy that aspect of it. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, that was one of the things when I came on to uh, NJT, um, I'd always wanted to have a, a CSI house or a uh, space. So, uh, I pitched the idea to our dean, and he was able to locate a space on campus that we retrofitted into a, an apartment, essentially. And we utilized this crime scene house in our CSI class. Uh, one of our professors, Kevin Parmalee, uh, who's a PhD in criminal justice and also a retired detective from uh, Somerset County, New Jersey, uh, he teaches our CSI and students, you know, absolutely love it. Um, usually, you know, we split the class in half and one half stages a crime scene for the other group. And then the other group processes the scene and we utilize it as a, a teaching tool. So, you know, we're teaching yeah. about sketches and photography, note taking, collection of evidence, all the proper procedures and PPE. And, you know, we have, of course, all the props and um, fake blood and all, all those sorts of things. And the students really come out of it uh, really appreciating, I think, what a, a real life CSI has to go through on a day in and day out basis. It's not an easy job. There's a lot to it. Um, you know, these scenes can take hours and hours to process. So I think after they've gone through it a couple of times, they really have a good understanding of, you know, what it takes to be a CSI. And, you know, also a, a deeper appreciation for the field and these types of individuals who do this type of work uh, day in and day out. We also have a couple cars, by the way. I don't think I mentioned, but uh, oh, no. we, we teach uh, vehicle processing. Nice. So it, on the bottom level of our parking deck, we have a, a couple of vehicles that were donated and students can use those to, you know, lift prints and collect traces from the trunk and the back seat and we're able to stage some pretty realistic uh crime scenarios for the students to work on right so like uh, raul saying here uh building the next generation of the best class investigators yes because we see the same errors still happening in 2024 and it, sometimes it's mind-boggling Right. So we will, um, you know, we're going to get into some of those errors in a second. I want to finish up with the program because I saw that you had uh, they do blood spatter analysis, latent prints, lifting them. I saw uh, there was a young young lady doing the lifting the prints for the um, I, I think he was the president of the college. So it was it was actually pretty interesting to see that because you can even see the students. They were so into it. 
that um, you know it's it's a it's a great way to do it. The blood spatter stuff, you I, that because of all the math, I wouldn't be able to pull that one off in a million years. I wouldn't have been able to do that. No way, no how. I mean, the calculations, uh, the blood spatter, the velocity, you name it, forget about it. You know, it's funny you you mentioned the math, and we we, uh, we found that using forensics as a a stealth mechanism to teach math to high school kids and college kids, it's a great way to get them interested in what otherwise, you know, could be a boring kind of subject. So one of the, one of the things we worked on is something called the Forensic Science Initiative. Uh, this was a, a grant that we got after COVID, you know, through a Department of Education. Um, it was called COVID Relief Money. And we put together this program for Newark public school kids, uh, specifically underrepresented uh, high school kids, where they would come to NJIT and take courses in forensics. And we would, you know, use use forensics as a stealth way of teaching trigonometry, which, you know, is a big part of blood spatter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this way, you know, we could hold their attention because we could show how trigonometry is relevant in the real world. And they actually, I think, got a lot out of it, uh, learning about chemistry and biology and mathematics through the lens of forensic science. So it was a really great opportunity to uh, to do this. It certainly is, because, I mean, as both uh, graduates with MSs from John Jay College, you know, we hear it all the time when you're teaching, like, what do I need to do this? It's not going to be on a job application. Now you can actually say it to the students. You have to be able to do this if you want to get into crime scene investigation and do all this stuff, because I tell you, I mean, when you look at those calculations and those formulas, it's enough to make somebody run for the hills like myself because I was not a good math student. And it's, um, you know, it is what it is, right? We're all not good at something. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the second word in forensic science is science. So we need to train our people to be scientists uh, because more and more they're under increased scrutiny from not only the courts, but, you know, the whole judicial system. And if they're not doing proper science and proper math, they're going to get called out on it, whether it be through their report writing or testifying in court. So we want to make sure that, you know, these new upcoming forensic scientists get it right and have confidence to know what they're talking about. Would you be able to explain to us the difference between individual and class characteristics when you're talking about evidence? Sure. Maybe an example. Yeah. So Essentially, there's two categories of forensic evidence, uh, or evidence can really be divided up into two categories. One, as you mentioned, class characteristics, and the other, individual characteristics. So I think the best way to explain it is with a example. So if we take, for example, a footwear impression from a, a shoe. So every shoe impression has certain class characteristics, and those are the size of the shoe, the manufacturer of the shoe. So let's take a Nike Air Jordan. Uh, so Nike or the brand is going to be a class characteristic because there are many Nike Air Jordans out there. Also, you know, a size seven, uh, let's say. And those are all class character characteristics that can be used to group a particular piece of evidence into um a category of evidence, whereas individual characteristics are something that can't easily be replicated among a lot of different pieces of evidence. So the wear and tear on the footwear impression, maybe the person stepped on a nail, so you're gonna have a, a puncture at a position at a particular position on the shoe. Uh, maybe there's some pebbles or rocks that they picked up. Uh, the soil on the shoe where they walked that day that soil is going to be unique uh, from other Nike Air Jordan size seven shoes, just because, you know, soil is typically different. Also, the wear and tear is going to uh, wear differently on one person's foot uh, and where they walk and how they walk from another person's uh, shoe. So th that's basically the difference between class and individual characteristics. I think the audience is catching on. It says, how many thoughts? This is going to be a quiz question. <laughs> yep. Yes, CH, you're catching on there. So there's going to be a lot of those here tonight. So just be prepared that you should be taking notes 
That's what makes your week a lot easier when you when you go in to do the test. So you speaking of um, let's say you mentioned shoe impressions, right? So what are some of the ways that they collect the um, impressions on the shoes? Right, it depends on what kind of substrate or what kind of what kind of um, thing it's on. Correct. Yeah, if it's on um, you know <clears throat> snow or mud, you might create a cast and cast the impression using something like dental stone, uh, which will create a you know a mold of the impression, and then that can be lifted. If it's a, a hard surface, um, you know you might use other development methods, uh, chemical enhancement, or even powders similar to fingerprints, and then you can collect those uh, impressions that are two dimensional as opposed to three dimensional. Um, yeah, so those are some of the the different ways to collect those impressions. Uh, funny you mentioned that some of our students were actually working on a project recently to upload images into the footwear database, otherwise known as Sycar. Uh, so Sycar uh, maintains known shoe impressions and shoe pictures so that you know if you find a shoe impression on a crime scene, you could upload that and get some information about the type of shoe. So it's an investigative tool for investigators and they can utilize that, you know, to further their investigation and perhaps identify a suspect. Yes. So the, there's, so uh, maybe they, people didn't know that there's a database just for shoe impressions like we have for fingerprints and we have for DNA and ballistics, right? So we have one for shoe prints. Who runs the uh, shoe print? database is it state local is it fbi who runs that uh yeah it's currently um a, i think it's privately privately uh, maintained by um foster and freeman um to, as far as my not yeah you know, as far as i i'm told uh, i think it's privately maintained and law enforcement and other uh, entities can upload known samples to it I guess uh, Bruno Mali wasn't in there back then, back in the day. <laughs> For those that don't know the Bruno Mali reference, right? O.J. Simpson and the uh, shoe impressions that they found at the at the scene, of the bloody shoe prints. But that was talking, yeah. like, we were talking early 1990s. It probably wasn't even existing back there. So, yeah, Janet wrote Crime Crocs. Yeah, probably today, right? We're going we're gonna to have a lot of Crocs at like crime Crocs. scenes. and Flip-flops and slides and all, all those things, which <laughs> aren't that useful usually because they're – the tread is usually worn down a, a lot right, pretty quickly. They don't so, always give that much information. When you're doing, when you when you're teaching students about uh, packaging of evidence, what are some of the rules that they that they need to adhere by when they're dealing with the different kinds of uh, evidence? So, like body fluids versus, let's say, a firearm, let's say, a, a tool mark or a tool print. How how, how we go about teaching them? Yeah, so when we teach about packaging, uh, different types of evidence obviously require different types of packaging. Uh, you want you want to choose the appropriate size first of all. So you're not going to put a single piece of hair in a, a large brown grocery bag. That this <laughs> unless you're Amazon, sense. right? <laughs> unless you're packaging stuff for Amazon, right? Uh, the other rule of thumb is you know biological evidence for the most part has to be put into a breathable type of packaging. So typically brown paper bags are the ideal packaging for biological evidence, because if you put it in plastic, you're gonna create an environment where mold can grow and it's just uh, bad for the, the DNA evidence. So, you know, blood, saliva, semen, stains don't do well under humidity and plastic uh, packaging. And then, you know, other types of evidence, uh, sharp items like knives or needles, you want to make sure that they're secured so they don't puncture the receiving forensic scientist or the evidence technician. So th those are typically secured in cardboard boxes. Uh, firearms should obviously be unloaded and preferably hand delivered to the crime lab by the detective or the CSI. Um, you know, powders and things like that should be put into um, some sort of vial uh, or a, a druggist fold and then secured with an outer packaging. 
So most types of evidence get an inner package and then an outer package with all the important information, case number, date, time, who collected it, um, what type of tests they want run, those sorts, those sorts of things. Yeah, and specifically the biologicals in paper was uh, something that we learned, unfortunately, the hard way, specifically in the 1990s. Because I remember when I was in cold case, you, you look for some of this evidence that was packaged in like 1992, 93, and it was put in plastic. Or there was one situation where we opened up the case file and there's a bloody shirt in the exact case file, you know. So things were done much differently back then compared to now. And But we still see mistakes being made. Yes, and you know you want to make sure your evidence storage facility is waterproof. I know the uh, a certain large metropolitan police department who will remain nameless. Uh, you know their evidence warehouse was uh, severely flooded in a, a big hurricane. So uh, yeah, and they just had one burned down not too long ago too. Yes. So we, so, we want to make sure that the actual building is secure and uh, waterproof and has smoke detectors and all those types of things. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'll name it. I used to work there, but New York City Police Department, they had a big fire. Unfortunately, there was DNA evidence in there, cold case stuff, a lot of different things that, um, you know, could go wrong. But when you're dealing with a large city like this and the amount of evidence, you got to put it somewhere. You don't have the, the facilities to do it. And you just have to, um, unfortunately, deal with the consequences of what happens. I mean, I used to hear everything, fires, floods, storm of locusts. I mean, you name it every excuse in the book about why you couldn't find evidence or why it was packaged improperly or repackaged. Uh, you had touched on it, but you didn't mention it. Let's talk about chain of custody. So when you're teaching your kids, uh, you're teaching your students and you talk about chain of custody, is this something that you kind of have to hammer home with them and explain to them step-by-step uh, step and why it's so important? Would you be able to explain to our, uh, our audience tonight what the chain of custody is and why it's so important? Sure. Uh, well, all my students know I take points off if there's no chain of custody. So <laughs> they certainly know what it is. And in our lab courses, when we give them mock evidence to work on in lab, uh, we go through chain of custody. Um, you know, a chain of custody, for those of you who don't know, is basically a, a record of who's had possession of that particular item from the time it's collected at the crime scene uh, until it's brought back to the evidence vault. And then the Crime and the crime, sorry, the forensic scientist who signs it out. Um, all of that is recorded, kind of like an audit trail, so that when it ends up in court, the trier of fact, whether it's the judge or the jury, can see every single person that's come into contact with that evidence. And if there's ever a break in the chain of custody, that can uh, unfortunately cause the evidence to be thrown out. And It'll come under question or won't be admissible in court. So it's a really important thing. I know a lot of defense attorneys will look at the chain of custody very carefully and attack any um, breaks in the chain or any um, improperly filled out chains of custody or if there's any date and time discrepancies. Those are all avenues where a good defense attorney is going to attack you on the witness stand. Yeah, and it's so easy, too, to do it also. So a lot of times they can't attack the evidence that you find, but they can attack the way you found it, you packaged it, and how you recorded it. And that's something that's really important. If you're just joining us now, we have David Fisher with us. He is the director of the Forensic Science Program at NJIT. We're up to 86 people watching live and even have Felicia, who's driving in the car. I hope you're doing it hands-free and listening in, Felicia. Thanks for joining us as uh, as we discuss everything forensic. So I'll... This was a everything you were afraid to ask about forensics uh, or you knew about forensics and afraid to ask. We can ask questions here tonight for sure. So um, here's a, a chain of custody question for you, Dave. So in terms of chain of custody, how is evidence transported to another location for testing? Uh, thinking of specialized testing such as IgG, I guess. So the, the that's a whole new avenue that we're learning about now with the genetic genealogy. But how does that go? So the, the transportation of evidence. Yeah, a great question. Uh, so yeah, anytime evidence is transferred, it should be in a sealed container. And we use evidence packing tape, which is tamper proof. So we can tell if someone tampered with it, opened it up. Uh, the tape is then signed and, or initialed with the date and time so that 
the person who packaged it, uh, that individual is recorded. And then the person opening it up on the other end is going to open it up from the opposite end of the package to keep that original seal intact. Um, if the other location is far away, uh, you can use, you know, commercial carriers like FedEx or USPS or um, UPS because they all have, you know, tracking papers and the person mailing the evidence is going to record when and where they dropped it off. And then the usually a tracking number is given through the shipping company so you can track its uh, progress through the to the other location. And then the person receiving it is going to sign for it. And that becomes the chain of custody uh, in that sense. So, you know, for IgG purposes, usually it's some kind of biological sample. We're talking about DNA. Uh, it could also be a known exemplar, uh, buckle swab, uh, which is a DNA sample from a suspect's or individual's mouth. Uh, it could also be a discarded item like a beverage container. And that would also be packaged in a, a paper type of packaging, sealed, initial dated, and that can be sent off or hand delivered to the other testing facility. Right. Yeah. We actually, you know, and, and every department's different too. We used to have what's called a letter transmittal where we would fill it out. We have all the evidence that we're taking to a specific location. And me as a test sergeant, I used to have to sign off on it and take a look at all the pieces of evidence. So and then make sure that the person who's taking it is the actual person whose name is on the sheet, because that's how important this chain of custody is. Yeah, and you hit on a lot of things, Dave. That really uh, talk, we talked about the Long Island serial killer case, right? So we had DNA we had abandonment samples that were taken, the pizza crust, the, the soda cans from the daughter. They had buckle swabs from the wife. So you, you hit on all of these things that are actually happening now in many of these cases. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on tonight, because it's so topical. And sometimes, the, you know, the, the casual viewer of this doesn't understand the importance of how this is done. And it has to be done correctly or it all gets thrown out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is really important stuff. And to the defense community's credit, you know, if CSIs and detectives and forensic scientists are not doing this correctly, then it shouldn't be allowed in. So uh, it's important that we can get it right and have the appropriate documentation uh, because all this will end up in court in an adversarial system. And both sides should have. Uh, confidence that the evidence has been collected and tested appropriately. Tennis Girl is also listening and driving at the same time. I hope you are uh, doing so safely, Tennis Girl. Thanks for stopping in there. The Deja Vu has got a question about this, the packaging of drugs. Okay, so we haven't spoken really about the uh, packaging of drugs and says, are confiscated drugs stored in original packaging? I guess... Um, Deja vu, you're also talking about like as when it has to be tested. Is that you know, so it has to be opened up, right, Dave? So when you send it to the lab, it's gonna be opened up, which means it's not gonna weigh the same amount as it did before. So this is all really important that it gets documented correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean the original packaging is usually included. So the baggie, uh, if it's a street buy or the glassy and envelope, uh, that's usually included and then is put into an outer type of packaging and sent to the, the drug anal analysis lab. And then the drug chemist is going to weigh it um, with the packaging and then without the packaging to get a, a true weight. Yeah, we got some great questions coming in here, Dave. So we're going to pepper you with a few of them. It says, can you specialize in just one type of forensics? I guess for a study kind of thing? Absolutely. Um, you know, my, my philosophy, and I, I try to tell this to my students, is you should be a generalist in a lot of different areas and know not everything, but a little something about as many forensic disciplines as you can, and then specialize in one or two areas. So yes, you can specialize in one type of forensics. I myself am trained in DNA, forensic biology, uh, but you know, I, I try to learn a little bit about all the disciplines just so I can know when to call in another expert to take a look at something. So you should know enough to know when you need to call somebody else. 
Okay, so we have um, another great question here from Crime Sleuthing. How common or rare is it to locate a single source of DNA on something? Uh, it depends on the nature of the sample. Um, you know, nowadays we have a lot of mixtures, especially with touch DNA and, and traces of DNA. Um, so something like a door handle is going to have uh, multiple sources. Something that's you know biological fluid um, is more likely to be single source. Or you know, if you find a drink container, uh, usually those are only drunk by a single person. Now you you can have a mixture on a a Coke bottle that is possible, but we would expect to usually find a single source on those types of samples. And then if it's an intimate source, um, you know, if it's a sexual assault sample, we would expect to find a mixture between the uh, victim's DNA and the uh, the suspect's DNA. So here's Deja Vu's got another question here about DNA. Each time is it tested, is it diminished in any way, DNA? Or is it replicated? Or is it, uh, how does that work? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, if you test a item multiple times, each time you're consuming part of that sample, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's what the person means, if it's diminished, but you're consuming part of that sample and you're testing. So, you know, in forensics, we start off with very small samples to begin with. So it is possible that you might have to consume a sample. Now, if you wanted to do that, you know, you want to make sure you get permission from the defense attorney as well as the prosecutor um, to do that. But we always try to keep a little bit in case the other side wants to do their own testing. Uh, so we try not to diminish or consume a sample if at all possible. Now, is there, do they, are they able to replicate that now though? So they can test it over and over again without affecting the original sample. How does that work, Dave? Is that, yeah, so that let's say from... you, if, if you had a crime scene swab of blood, <clears throat> let's say, you would take a cutting of that swab, perform your DNA test. Hopefully the swab is still going to have uh, other blood on it for future testing or additional testing that's requested. So we would hope that the sample is going to give the same results, uh, but it is possible that one side of the swab could have one person's DNA and the other side of the swab could have someone else's DNA. So typically we wouldn't see that, but theoretically it is possible that, you know, we might get different results, but most of the time we would get the same results from that same sample or the same extract. So we extract the DNA into a, uh, a liquid and that liquid is kept into a tube. So further testing could be done from the liquid in that tube or the tube could be sent to another laboratory for confirmatory testing or additional testing. So Janet Murphy has a question for you. It says, what exactly is trace DNA? So really uh, this is what we refer to as traces. Um, trace DNA is DNA that's just left behind uh, from our day-to-day -day activity. You know, when you touch something, you're going to slough off skin cells from your hands. Um, if a person has dandruff, let's say, they might shed some uh, DNA from their scalp. Um, our hairs from our scalp also shed, and that could also leave behind DNA. Uh, so trace DNA is... You know, any, any person's house, they're going to have the DNA of the people living there or a place of business, people who have come in as customers or the employees, we would expect their DNA to be there. So that's considered trace DNA. Of course, if you're looking for a perpetrator or a suspect's DNA, um, we would need the people who had legitimate access to that scene in order to make sure we're not uploading um, the victim's DNA or, or people who have legitimate access to that scene, we want to make sure that we're not uploading their profiles to CODIS, which is the DNA database. So uh, oftentimes, you know, we have to compare question samples to known samples. So we want to make sure we collect elimination samples, victim samples to make sure we're 
putting the right, the putative perpetrator into the database. So Crime Solution says, just to clarify on her question, she says, in a case I'm following, the report says they found a single source of DNA on a sheath. I wonder if this happens to do anything with Idaho, but we don't know. Uh, so that is to be expected, basically, since it would be likely only been handled by the perpetrator. So uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming this is the uh, Brian Kohlberger case up there. They found the, uh, so his DNA on the knife sheath where four students were murdered. Um, so I'm assuming that's where the single source of DNA question comes from. Yeah, so, you know, with DNA, we can only tell who the source of the DNA belongs to. We, we can't really opine on how it got there. So there is oh, such a thing as secondary and tertiary transfer. So, you know, we get into all those types of questions a lot in court and the hypotheticals of, you know, if person A touch person B and then person B touch person C, well, person A's DNA could end up on person C without them ever having come into contact with one another. Okay. So those are all important things to consider uh, when testifying and report writing. So LS, who's also driving in the car on her way to work, uh, says, what is the biggest misconception about forensic science? Uh, so I think the biggest misconception is you know what everyone sees on tv and the csi shows that they're going to be out in the field uh chasing down suspects and interrogating them and making arrests that couldn't be farther from the truth most of our time is spent testing evidence in a laboratory report writing and testifying in court uh occasionally you, you do go into the field if you're a, a field investigator like a csi in which case, you know, you'll process the scene and collect evidence. Um, but I would say that's probably the biggest misconception and also the amount of science that's involved. People think uh, they can go into this field without knowing math and science. And unfortunately, uh, that they can't, or at least they can't and do well as, as a forensic scientist. And uh, <clears throat> that leads us right into the next question. Catch a Catch a choo choo, I guess, or choo choo. <clears throat> it says, I'm curious about the difference of the training students are receiving now compared to 10 or even 20 years ago. So, this is actually right up your alley here. So, Joe, you, I mean, you mentioned that we both went to John Jay for our master's degrees. Um, back when I was at John Jay, um, I would say the biggest change has just been the technology, uh, especially in DNA. I mean, the instrumentation and, and the sensitivity. Uh, it's just so much greater. Um, so you really need to have an understanding about, uh, you know, how machines work because you might be asked to troubleshoot uh, something that goes down. Uh, so you have to know a little bit about engineering. Um, also, the sensitivity uh, has certainly gone way, way up. So whereas when I first started out, you know, a DNA sample had to be about the size of a, a dime. And we would be doing a technology called RFLP, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. Um, that, you know, that was DNA fingerprinting back when it first started. Now they have PCR, polymerase chain reaction and next generation sequencing, which is they're just light years ahead of the technology when it first started out. And of course, Forensic Investigative Genetic Genealogy, otherwise known as FIG. And that's, you know, I think where the field is going. Uh, so all these new technologies, um, certainly AI is going to play a big role in a lot of this uh, going forward into the future. So I think time will tell. But uh, yeah, the technology is, I would say, by far the biggest change. Yep. I agree with you. So if you're just joining us now, we have David Fisher. He is the director of the Forensic Science Program at NJIT, a former criminalist for New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner, which we're going to get into in a second. We had some great questions. Just remember, please, to like the show and subscribe if you haven't. That helps us out a lot here and bring on some great guests and content so that you can uh, continue to learn from the experts that are, have been in the field and have done this for a living. So who are you with has a good question. It says, why does DNA testing take so long? 
So in theory, it really doesn't. If, you know, if you're doing one sample for one case in a vacuum, I mean, you could get results in a couple hours. The reason why it takes so long is because these laboratories are working on hundreds of cases at a time with multiple items of evidence and multiple samples from each of those items. So when you put all of that together, you know, it does create a queue. Um, and, you know, the biggest backlog is not the actual testing, it's the report writing and the review. So, you know, a lot of labs now have robotics. So they're pushing through the samples on robotic platforms. Uh, that's not the, the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the human review. So, you know, we, we could speed it up by hiring more trained forensic scientists to push out the reports and more technical reviewers to review the, the data. Um, but all those, of course, take time and money and resources. Um, so I, I guess that's why it takes so long. But, you know, you can always put an expedited request on a high profile case. Uh, sometimes those get put to the front of the line uh, or private laboratories can run these samples a lot uh, quicker than your typical public sector laboratory. I'm going to piggyback a question on this one. What about toxicology reports? Those seem to take forever to get back. Yes, they do. Uh, the reason for <clears throat> that is because, you know, with the tox labs, they run a, a screen initially for the most common types of drugs. Um, the reason why it takes so long is because, you know, when they're looking for different types of prescription drugs or lesser known drugs, less common drugs, they have to run additional assays. And if you're looking for something that you don't know whether or not it's there, you know, you have to make sure you cover all your bases. So there's multiple types of tests, depending on the, the type of drug that they're looking for. And, and that's really why the tox reports take so long to complete the medical examiner's um, cause and manner of death. So usually that's the only thing they're waiting for, the toxicology report before they can uh, determine the cause and the manner of the death. Yeah, because people tend to be upset about how long it takes for the toxicology reports to come back. So I'm glad who you're with asked that question because that triggered me to ask this one. Here's a question. Um, maybe you can help out Raul on this. Is, I do have a slightly odd question that doesn't have to be asked, but we're going to ask it anyway. How solid is sperm density in forensics? Is this something that you can answer to? Because I've never really heard of this one. Yeah, I'm not sure what sperm density is. Okay. Uh, so, Raul, if you can just um, let us know exactly. I can, I can try to answer. Okay. So, yeah, Mom Central saying, so continued education for the forensic scientists is a must. Absolutely. Uh, when you're employed as a forensic scientist, you're required to complete continuing education, just like doctors and lawyers have to have a certain number of CE credits. So to uh, forensic scientists, because the field is so rapidly changing, it's important for us to go to conferences and workshops, also read a lot. You know, the scientific literature is quite vast. I mean, there's so much out there and you know there's no way you can know it all so it, it's helpful to subscribe to um you know these listservs that kind of give you a a condensed version of the latest research and the different disciplines um if you don't have time to read an entire article you know try to at least read an abstract which kind of summarizes different uh, types of research that have been done and just, you know, networking and learning what other people are doing, going to workshops and seminars, whether they're in person or virtual, there's a lot of virtual education that you can find for free online. So you always want to try to keep up with the ever growing field of forensic science. And for the true crime fan who's into this stuff, they, they could pick up a copy of your book, right? The Forensic Demystified kind of breaks things down for people in layman's terms. And they can you can answer some of these questions. Deja Vu's got a question. I don't know how familiar you are with the IgG, but it says, are chromosomes paired in IgG testing? Um, no, I, IgG testing focuses on what are called SNPs, which are um, 
um, basically the individual DNA building blocks. So they're looking at um, those individual base pairs, which, you know, I suppose are on the chromosomes, but it's a different technology than we use in STR DNA typing. Patricia wants to know what does it mean? What does latent mean when applied to forensic set of crime scene? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's actually, I, I did a quiz question on this too, though, Patricia. So maybe you want to go back there. But you can, um, could you answer that for us? Sure. So latent, latent means not visible to the naked eye. So a latent <clears throat> fingerprint, for example, is a print that you can't see, but it's still there. So we need to develop it somehow, either using fingerprint powder or chemicals. And then once it becomes visible, we can lift the print um, and do further comparisons with it. So there, there's a couple of different categories of fingerprints. There's latent prints. Um, there's patent prints, which are fingerprints in something that's visible, like blood or ink or grease. And then there's uh, impression prints, which are prints made in um, 3D or pliable types of substances like wax or putty where the, the print is actually impressed into something soft. Yeah, I always tease my students, it's just in case the burglar comes and decides to build a statue for you in the living room, <laughs> to let you know I left his fingerprints all over the place. But usually maybe in a piece of gum, you can find it, right. uh, or on tape, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, some kind of soft food. Yeah, Yeah. no, we, we actually had a burglar that used a, a part of his uh, signature, he would make himself a sandwich, and he would leave half the sandwich behind, and then and then DNA stuff came about. We get it tested, and sure enough, they were able to they were able to catch him uh, in regards to that. So Deja Vu says, "I hope you're paying this guy tonight to answer all these questions." Now Dave is doing this all on his own time, so he's he's here to help us out answer these questions so that we can become better informed. So when we're watching these trials and you're or you're going to class, or you're doing these things. These are the kind of thing you know the questions, and you don't get a chance to sit down and ask an expert like this. Uh, just about anywhere else. So it's actually pretty enlightening. So let's, we have, the time we have left, I know this, uh, the questions have kind of slowed up a little bit, but you were a criminalist for the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Can you tell us what the criminalist was and what you did for OCME? Sure. So a criminalist, not to be confused with a criminologist, which deals with the social science aspect of a uh, crime study. A uh, criminalist deals with, you know, the forensic evidence and the natural sciences. So in New York City, there were uh, criminalist positions um, for the ME's office. And also the uh, NYPD crime lab also employed criminalists. And we would be tasked with examining evidence, doing various um, triaging to determine you know, what tests would be needed or warranted, um, gathering the data, writing reports, um, and then uh, you know, testifying as needed. Uh, also interacting with detectives uh, often, as well as the medical examiner to determine, you know, the sequence of testing. That's also an important consideration. Um, you know, what what order should the different types of forensic tests be conducted in? And then, you know, what questions were we trying to have answered? So it's, it's one thing for a detective to come in and say, hey, I want this test done, but sometimes if we offer them, you know, some other suggestions, they might say, well, hey, I never thought of that. Maybe we should do X before Y, and we, we might get a better answer uh, doing it this way. Uh, so, so, yeah, those, those are some of the main um, areas that a criminalist uh, would, uh, would do. I might know the answer to this one, but um, we, we didn't uh, specify the reason why, but Turquoise Kitten has a question that says, what got you started in this field? Joe, I think you probably know the answer to this. <laughs> Good old dad, right? So for those I, that didn't put two and two together, David Fisher is the son of Barry A.J. Fisher, who I had a couple of weeks ago. But we didn't tell everybody that off the bat. But, uh, yeah, so is that, I'm assuming that that's the answer to that question. You could say I went into the family business. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I grew up in California and having a father as a forensic, forensic scientist, I always found it to be fascinating. Um, you know, when we were 
at parties or get togethers, people would always ask my dad, you know, what do you do? And he would tell them. And I always just thought it was like the coolest job out of all the other dads. And when we used to be kids, we would, you know, bring your parent to work or to school, as I'm sure, you know, a lot of parents go to their kids' schools. And my friends always said, like, ah, your dad always, your dad has the coolest job out of all the dads. So it was almost uh, a natural decision to to go into this. Um, you know, we always had fascinating dinner conversations growing up. I uh, would hear about some of the cases he had worked on. And, you know, he, he did, uh, one could say, some bizarre things. He took me to my first autopsy at the age of nine. <laughs> So I got uh, pretty early exposure to forensics. Uh, I remember going to the lab with him as a kid, and I just thought it was always really fascinating. And I figured uh, uh, I would go into the field. I didn't start out as a forensic science major. I was pre-med uh, originally. And then about halfway through college, I said, medicine sounds too boring. I'm going to do forensics. So here I am all these years later. I think that if you brought your nine-year-old son to an autopsy today, they'd probably report you to the Child Services Bureau. <laughs> I'm no, sure no of doubt. it today. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, you have an opportunity. Your dad is a great storyteller, and he was able to tell some stuff. So well, I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you can, on a case that's closed or something you want to talk about, or you could just talk in generalities. Can you tell us a, a, a story, whether it's funny, serious, whatever it may be? Can you tell us a story? Um, let's see, I guess, you know, the case that really stands out and probably will be with me for the rest of my life is 9-11. Um, just working on, uh, that large scale of a, of a national event, um, you know, having everybody work together, all the folks in New York city coming together, um, as one unified city really stuck out. Uh, at the time, I was an intern uh, at the Emmy's office, and I got hired uh, shortly after in the beginning of 2002. So, you know, when 9-11 hit, um, like I said, I was interning there, and it was just, the whole thing was just totally surreal. And having all the agencies there on uh, 30th Street represented in their respective trailers, uh, local, state, federal agencies, um, that really stuck out. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a part of me for the rest of my life, uh, working with all those dedicated folks, law enforcement, forensic scientists, um, the families of the victims. Uh, that was just really something that um, stood out. And of course, all the technology that was developed to help identify the human remains. Uh, a lot of the technology that we have today is a direct result of 9-11. And New York City OCME was a big part in developing a lot of that technology to identify, you know, a small piece of bone that was recovered from the pile. Um, you know, the, obviously the pile down at uh, Ground Zero. Uh, so I, I think that was probably the most memorable case. And... Mm -hmm. Even to this day, they're still working on it. Uh, yeah. They're going back, testing samples multiple times as the technology develops. Uh, you know, I'm obviously no longer part of it, but I know there's still a team at OCME that's dedicated to making sure that they can do everything possible to identify those people and hopefully help those families find closure. Yeah, for... Um... For a good part of two years, I worked under the facility, under the Brooklyn Bridge and the facility there, sifting through and doing the supervision and stuff over there. Uh, we had Barbara Butcher on not too long ago also, <clears throat> and uh, she talked about the same thing, about, about the camaraderie and, and how everybody was working together as a team. And I, that's like the common story that I, I hear about 9-11, including my own experiences. And it's something, I guess, because it's such a horrific event, uh, it kind of just sticks with you and that. And then you look around and say, what do you really have at that moment? Right. So it's the family, the camaraderie, the the the, the focus, the mission and all the other things that, that went along with it. And that's, I think, what's what will stick with us the rest of our lives, too. 
Absolutely. And you know, a lot of places have learned uh, a lot of lessons from 9-11. Other mass fatality events, people have looked to New York City as a, uh, a role model and uh, uh, someone to you know develop procedures and how to process uh, these mass fatality incidents. So you know, we see in the world today, whether it's a, a natural event or um, a man-made type of mass fatality event, uh, those are really important things to help the living, you know, the family members of those who have passed away to to help them find closure. So forensics is a really uh, important area uh, in that respect. Just one more thing before you go, I had mentioned about a lot of things that happened because of 9-11 in New York City and the OCME put forward. And one of those, I believe, was mitochondrial DNA, right? Uh, using it to identify uh, those small pieces of bone or teeth. And that, and that actually becomes part of the scientific record in, in the court procedures, correct? Yes. Yeah, in fact, I was one of the people who helped uh, set up the mitochondrial DNA lab at uh, the ME's office. So... Your mitochondrial DNA is a different type of DNA, uh, has different applications, um, but it, it's definitely one of the tools we have in our toolbox to help identify uh, samples that perhaps can't be typed for nuclear DNA. So I won't get into all the uh, the biology of mitochondrial DNA, right. but uh, those of your listeners who are interested, there's a lot of online resources they can read up about how mitochondrial DNA is different than nuclear DNA. Right, and I get to tell my students, just remember, M for mitochondrial, M for mom, because that's who it's derived from. Uh, just one question before you go, because it actually has a little bit of a pop culture thing. It says, question for David Fisher, how do fiction novels like Patricia Cornwell compared to real life? I consume those books. So we don't want to really uh, make sure that fun, uh, fun and funky doesn't read anymore, but how, how accurate are some of those forensics and some of these books that you that you hear about or read? Well, actually, a lot of these authors and screenwriters will hire forensic science, forensic scientists as consultants to try to make their story more realistic. And I've done a couple of those. And, you know, you, you read through these manuscripts or screenplays, and uh, some of them need a little tweaking. <laughs> but uh, you make suggestions to make it more believable, more realistic. Uh, some authors prefer to take artistic license and, you know, leave it as the way they've written it. But others really appreciate, you know, your feedback uh, as far as what's real, what's fiction. Uh, I think a lot of authors nowadays try to get it right and they want their novels or screenplays to be as accurate and realis realistic as possible because the public really is interested in this and consumes a lot of um, you know, media and uh, TV shows about forensic science. So there is some uh, areas that can be approved upon, certainly. But uh, I think for the most part, in general, they do get it right. Um, but that being said, you know, sometimes uh, we certainly do not solve cases in 45 minutes like they do on TV. With three and, commercials. Right. <laughs> You don't wear sunglasses and drive around Hummers in Manhattan, <laughs> tracking down evidence and chasing bad guys. Well, listen, Dave, uh, thank you very much. We, we took you a little bit of overtime, but I think it was uh, the, we had a lot of great questions here tonight. So, Dave, you hang out one second. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., I'll be on live with Dave Sarney, retired NYPD detective. We're going to be breaking down some of the cases that you guys are following at 8 a.m. tomorrow for Roll Call. So, Dave, you hang out one second. Everybody else, have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care, Thanks everybody. Bye. Anytime, Dave. Thank you. Thanks.